for each participant ID, please use your real name following with your origin of institution. All of participants are expected to mute the audio and only unmute the video during the event. We cordially invite you to take your own firm and comfort seat in your own room and please avoid the backlight. Make sure that you have a good and stable internet connection. If you have an earphone or headset, we recommend you to use it so that your voice can clearly and loudly to be heard. During the Q&A discussion session, all participants, please use the chat box to deliver the questions. Thank you for your cooperation and consideration. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to guest lecture series on SDGs today, Wednesday, 28 April 2021. I'm Pippa Yangdeni from ITS Global Engagement and will be your Master of Ceremony this evening. Thank you for joining our guest lecture series on SDGs tonight. Before we start our agenda, let me inform you some rules for the events. First, please adjust your name or ID screen using format name underscore your campus name. Second, during the lecture, please turn off your microphone and only turn on the microphone when the moderator gives you the chance. Third, please fill your attendance at bit.ly slash attendance slash underscore gel SDGs. Our committee also sent the attendance link on the Zoom chat room. For the participant who wish to get a certificate and stamp, please fill the attendance 15 minutes after the season. Fourth, participant who wish to ask question during the question and answer session, please send your question to intip.in slash Q&A, GLS, SDGs, the link for questions listed on the chat room as well. Or you can ask directly by clicking the raise hand feature. Today's topic is mass operation in Asia and Latina America that will be delivered by our speaker, Professor Viviano Filarian Buron from Universidad de Monterrey. The lecture will be moderated by Ibu Novi and Dani Teguh from ITS. Before we start our agenda, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follow. First, opening. Second, introduction to moderator and speaker. Third, lecture session. Fourth, Q&A session. Fifth, a certificate awarding. And sixth, closing. Now, before we proceed to the next agenda, let me introduce our moderator today. Our moderator today is Ibu Novi Andriani Tegu from Department Civil Engineering ITS. She has education background um, in 2014 that she got bachelor on civil engineering at ITB, Institute of Technology Bandung, Indonesia. And in 2017, she got master program at the Banden Waterbrook, Germany. And she also has a research, research experience and publication in 2020, she got Journal of Infrastructure and Facility Asset management, and in 2019, Sigal International DAAD Alumni Expert Seminar in Environmental Strategy and Water Technologies in Kerala, India. Now, without further ado, let's proceed to debate agenda. To Ibu Novi, the time is yours. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, to the committee for the opportunity to be involved in this event. Uh, I am Novi Andrini Tegu, and it is my honor to be here to be the moderator for today's session of GL GLS on SDGs. Uh, for today's topic, uh, will be related to SDGs number nine, which are uh, to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable indus industrialization, and foster innovation. And maybe I will uh, go straight to the point. Uh, point. 
Uh, please allow me to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, here we have Professor Piano Villarreal Bueron from the University of Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, he got the uh, Master in Architecture in Los Angeles and then Bachelor of Architecture in the University of Monterrey in Mexico. And currently he is the founder and director at Mass Operation. Uh, Mass Operation is an architecture firm based in Monterrey, Mexico. And uh, before uh, become the founder and director at Mass Operation, he is an architect in uh, as a business manager at OMA Hong Kong. And before that, he is the junior architect at uh, Amsterdam Netherlands. And recent project, he has a lot of project, uh, mostly in Mexico, but um, as an architect, he has uh, traveled the world while working and collaborating with diverse architecture firms uh, within the USA, Mexico, the Netherlands, Denmark, Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to uh, listen to some insight from Professor Piano. Um, his presentation titled Mass Operation in Asia and Latin America, without further ado. Now I invite uh, Professor Viviano Villarreal Bueron. Hello, Professor Viviano, how are you? Hello, I'm doing good. Good morning over here. It's uh, 7 a.m. It's a bit early in Mexico, but I'm super excited to be here with you today. And it's an honor. Uh, I, again, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Um, okay, now um, without further ado, uh, the time is yours. Perfect. Okay. So <laughs> let, me, let me share my screen and we can start. Um, I have um, a lot of videos in my presentation. So I just want to do a quick video check with you. You should be able to see uh, your lovely logo of ITS. And please let me know with thumbs up or by telling me if you can hear and see test. It almost feels like if we were at the, at the cinema, no? I miss the cinema with this uh, COVID times that we're living through. Um, also, bit, now that I've said thank you again uh, for the invitation, which again, it's an honor, I, I really want to uh, extend my appreciation to Vivi, who behind the scenes has been doing uh, a lot of work and she's been very diligent uh, providing all the information. So I, I'm sure she's a very valuable asset for the university. So Vivi, thank you so much for all your work. And of course, not only we got to meet each other briefly uh, my last night, so it's uh, really lovely to meet you and uh, looking forward to the Q&A discussion afterwards. I want to start, before I start off, I want to start off with this slide. Every time I give a presentation now since this year, since I've been doing a lot of them online as we are all kind of Zoomified, um, we've been living culturally and uh, in our profession a, a, a global change of, um, of equality in many different aspects and architecture is no difference. And uh, I'm gonna be speaking today from my perspective and from my work and from my experience, which of course I am a man. And so I, I teach as you'll see in this presentation as well. And usually 50% of my classmates are female. But when I get out there in the profession, I see more men than women. And I think that's starting to change. And if I can do something besides teaching, female architects and promoting female architects is this. Uh, in my presentations, I always start with a small slide of presenting to whoever I'm speaking to, um, different architects that I know of in Mexico that are young and up and coming and that are usually not promoted when we talk about female architects in Mexico because usually we get the list of already very well-known architects. And I think we've realized, especially now with the pandemic, the value of a little button called follow and the value of engaging with someone when they're young and, and starting out their businesses as architects. So I'll, I'll just leave with you here three different profiles that are very different uh, from Mexican uh, women in architecture. Ana Rebeca Mata in Concentrico is doing some amazing work. 
Uh, they both do interior and, ar and architecture, but they have a bigger portfolio in interiors and they're very, very, um, the, the word escapes me, but right now in English, they're very heart-filled interiors. So um, I want to share with you her profile of Concentrico under slash. Aranza Garcia in the south of Mexico, um, in Merida, has a very interesting new project, which is a gallery that mixes art, but it also mixes industrial design and interior design. It's called Chuch, Chuch Studio, which is super fun and brand new. So any follow that you give to her, it's going to be really good for her uh, promotion. And finally, Shirley Ordóñez and Alejandro Villarreal, which is also my last name, but we're not related, have a, uh, an architecture studio that is almost two years old now, that's right around the pandemic, uh, called Non-Studio. It's a studio, but it's called Non-Studio, and they do just beautifully, uh, uh, painfully beautiful work. So I want to leave that with you, and uh, you can take a screenshot a shot of it, and then take a look afterwards, and I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please engage with them, because they'll really appreciate it. Before I start, uh, as Novi already introduced me, my name is Viviano Villarreal. I have a studio called Mass Operations. I also teach everything that I do teaching-wise with my students. Uh, I do it under Catedra Mass. And with a professor of the public university here in Monterrey, Mexico, I have a, a podcast called uh, Arc y Filosofía, which you can find in YouTube, where we talk about architecture and philosophy. Most of it is in Spanish, but recently we interviewed in English the son of Richard Neutra, which was amazing. And Richard Neutra being a really famous architect in California, key to understanding modernism in Latin America. And I hope that we'll have a good discussion afterwards, because for me, what most interests me of these kind of uh, presentations is getting to speak to you guys. Now, I want to start with a provocation. I don't know now that you're students and are dealing with architecture every single day, how much do you actually spend time in thinking what actually is architecture? And what is it to be an architect? And what is an architect? What is not an architect? Um, and I want to share with you this little discussion amongst two giants of the art and architecture field. Let's take a quick listen. Becoming I mean, architects are not even artists as far as you're concerned. For the most, absolutely not. Because? Are you going to tell me buildings are works of art? Yes. Oh, so are people then, and so we have... No, 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 no. Are no, you saying no. to me that Frank Lloyd Wright never created a single work of art, whether it's furniture, whether it's... Oh, furniture's art now. Tree, uh, how about plum... Uh, uh, you know, where do you, where do you want to start? Well, I don't know, but I... Art is purposely useless, and that's what makes it more free than buildings. Okay, but is that... But is the difference then... Look, there are aspects in buildings that you can say deal with the provenance of sculpture or deal with the overlay of painting, but don't start telling me buildings are works of art, because I don't buy it. What uh, if you do know these people, that's Charlie Rose, who is a very famous interviewer or journalist in the U.S. And that's Richard Serra, who is an artist that does these beautiful um, sculpture pieces made out of one single piece of cork and steel that are humongous. And there Richard Serra, in a very angrily position, is, is about to punch Charlie Rose for suggesting that architects have anything to do with art or producing art or being artists. And he says in a very frank way, in a very angry way, look, art has no purpose. Art has no use. And that's what makes it free. Architecture has plumbing. Architecture has budgets. Architecture has a use to cover your head from the rain. That cannot be art. Don't call it art. Interesting enough, a month later in Charlie Rose Sames program, Renzo Piano, which I think needs no introduction, a giant of architecture, has a good response to this. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Architecture is about making shelter for yeah. human That's why Richard thinks it's not art, because it has function. Uh, yes, but it's also about telling stories. Architecture is also about, is also about semantics, it's about illusion, it's about telling stories, otherwise it's not architecture. It's only the combination of the, of the materiality of making building and uh, the humanistic side of telling stories that makes give sense to a place or to a building. Otherwise, the building has no sound. Otherwise, the building doesn't sing. And did you notice that some buildings sing yes, and other don't? Yeah. There, Renzo Piano, in a very Italian way, explains it beautifully, that it cannot only be the physical ass of building that makes architecture. You need to mix that with the human side. Because otherwise, what you get is a construction, a built project. Doesn't mean it's architecture. It's the mixing of stone 
and the, the labor and the physical aspect, the engineering of building something with the human side of telling stories he talks about. He later goes on to say something very beautiful in that interview that, that he says, and you know, telling stories, well, he says, some buildings have soul, some buildings don't have soul, some buildings sing, some don't. And he says, poetry lasts longer than stones, which I think is very true. Poetry, like the, the stories of Homer, the Iliad, are passed on from generation to generation, and those buildings disappear with the weather, you know? So I focus a lot of my work in the studio based around this discussion and also with my students, because I'll tell you a little, a little insight. And by the way, I apologize. Those translations are put in by me for my students in Mexico. They're in Spanish. I just realized um, I copied the wrong clips, but I hope that you guys got it in English and also with my explanation afterwards. I think they're both right. I think Richard Serra and Renzo Piano are both right. The thing is that architects in medieval times used to be educated in a workshop scenario. These are the craft medieval guilds. These guys were architects together with the carpenters, together with the uh, masonry workers. And at some point in the 1400s in Florence with the Medici, they came up with the idea that the architect should be educated in the arts, philosophy, music, uh, sculpture, painting, etc. And they created this academy, the Neoplatonic Academy uh, by the Medici in Florence and started educating architects there. And you know, Michelangelo came out from that academy. And that set a very important precedent in, in, in our profession. And from that point on, architecture is a philosophic endeavor because it can go stronger on the engineering side or it can go stronger on the artistic side. But if you don't have both sides, just like, for example, chocolate, if you don't have cacao and some butter, it's not really chocolate. You need to have both sides. If you have more butter, it's white chocolate. If you have less butter, it's dark chocolate. The mixing of this is what creates architecture. With regards to art, any object that has a function, which is what Serra is talking about, and you take away that function, it becomes a piece of art. This fork, if I take away the ability for it to function as a fork, it becomes a piece of jewelry. It's no longer functional, it's an art piece. Anything that has a function and it's taken away, it becomes art. So it's important for us as architects to be involved in the discussion and understanding there's not gonna be an answer to the discussion, but you need to be aware of it. Because what is the architect? If I Google architect, I'm gonna find people with hard hats and constructions with big pointing at big plans that are really rarely now printed any, 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 at any point in these days. So is an architect, according to Google, somebody that builds? And if I design something that is not built, then am I not an architect? So if that's the case, then actually it's my ideas that make me an architect. It's the know-how that makes me an architect. And those ideas, the only way they can be communicated are through drawings. So then actually the most important thing of an architect, it's his or her drawings communicated as an idea. We don't know. It's all of the above and it's none of the above. So with that little point, I'll come back at the end of the presentation to this point with my teaching. Now, the way I structure this little, little talk is in three points. I'll show some of my students' experience and professional experience before I, I started the office, some of my practice, and a little bit of what I do with my students uh, and my teaching side. Um, in no small way, I'm here thank you, thanks to my own professors. I had a, a very... Uh, for, very good fortune to have amazing professors both in Mexico and outside of Mexico. Uh, for example, in Mexico, I had here Agustin Landa, and in Barcelona, I had Miguel Roldan, uh, which really changed me as a young architect for the rest of my life. Now, below the line, I have other professors, which were my bosses, because the relationship between a teacher and their student in architecture, for me, is exactly the same as a boss and a collaborator in an office. And that's the same way I work with my team in my office. In that sense, I had the opportunity to work uh, here in Mexico, but also in Chile, in Holland, and eventually in Hong Kong. I started here doing uh, electrical trusses for wirings in supermarkets. That was my first job where I learned AutoCAD even before I learned it in school. Uh, but I wanna show you just as a starting point, my final project in architecture. 
which was with Agustin Landa, which was a small campus uh, designed for a small university. I want to show you a little bit of the studio culture because we had what was called a 24 hour classroom where we had our own working space where nobody touches your computer, nobody touches your models, and you can just be there the whole time. This studio was a special studio where we had a travel studio. We went to see Louis Kahn's buildings in California and Texas. And it was a very involved class, 10 students only, uh, all selected by portfolio, so not everybody could go in. And it really changed my professional life. There you can have a feel of my final project in architecture. This is uh, 13 years ago. That was SketchUp version four. Uh, I think we're now in SketchUp versions 20 something. After my final project, I was able to then work in Chile with this architect, Felipe Sari, who's uh, had these beautiful houses while he was kind of 35 years old. Some of them have been featured, for example, like in this movie, uh, where actually the house itself becomes a character in the movie because 90% of the story happens inside that house. Uh, but then I went into Europe <clears throat> and it was the first time I went to Europe as uh, a practicing uh, young architect, still as a student, but working, not studying. And I got to collaborate with this uh, studio in Amsterdam called Search Architects, which again, in, not in a movie, but in a, not in a Netflix series, uh, one of the projects I worked on has become wider known thanks to the series called um, Most Amazing Homes or something like that on Netflix. With a beautiful concept, this is in the Swiss mountains, where the idea was to keep these chalets that are part of the culture there, that are kind of uh, historical now, and to bury an underground tunnel to actually reach the actual new house, which is then buried again into the Swiss mountaintop, mountainside, actually. Uh, so these projects started to give me uh, an, an ed education that strong, provocative ideas uh, could be very interesting and if they have a solid base reasoning behind them will be successful and i think that really crystallized with this project in denmark that i got to work on this project was a a um, competition for the government in denmark where the government proposed this type of city blocks and so we realized that if we did what the government was asking us to do these l-shaped blocks uh buildings then only the facades here placed in blue would actually have views of the, of the sea. And this plot of land was in front of the sea. So that in Denmark is terrible because views of the sea also means sunlight, which in Denmark is really cold. So you need a lot of warmth. So we propose this, the same L blocks, but to do peaks and valleys with a very solid base reasoning to solve a problem. These peaks get views of the sea and allow sunlight to come into the apartments. And in front of those peaks, you do a valley. So you allowed for every apartment to get sunlight and every apartment to get uh, views of the ocean. That's us. That's me. Uh, days before we handed in the final submission, that's uh, 2008, quite a few years ago now. And the project was successful and we won the competition. Here's a small video.
Okay, that was my experience as a student. And I thought that uh, I was perfectly then capable of starting my own office in 2008 as I graduated in the summer of 2008. Now, um, you guys are studying, uh, and so you're younger than I am. So I don't know if you might remember what happened uh, in that summer of 2008, because what happened- No, oh, he has no idea how bad it is out there. He has no idea. He has no idea. Kramer. I have talked to the heads of almost every single one of these firms in the last 72 hours, and he has no idea what it's like out there. None! And Bill Poole has no idea what it's like out there. My people have been in this game for 25 years, and they are losing their jobs, and these firms are going to go out of business, and he's nuts! They're nuts! They know nothing! Kramer. Now... In 2008, people didn't used to shout on TV. We, of course, unfortunately, are living a drastically different media environment in 2021. But what this man was saying was that the global financial collapse was coming, and it did in 2008. And that's where I was proposing to start my own practice, right? And so what happened to us here in Mexico was that the peso, Mexican peso to dollar rate, went from 10 pesos per dollar to 15 and the unemployment rate went from three to 6%, which is uh, bad news, of course. Um, and that's when I started my own practice. And you know, there's never a good time to start a practice. It's, it's an entrepreneurial uh, uh, moment, but I was doing fairly okay, uh, doing small renovations and small projects. But the thing is the clients that I was getting were only interested in me because I was uh, perhaps recommended by someone, but I was very cheap because I was just a new grad. And I thought I needed to kind of wait some time to get more experience to be able to command better clients or better projects. So I reached out to my old bosses, my old professors, uh, to get letters of recommendation to do a master's degree in 2008. Uh, and what happened was that David Genoten, my boss from Holland, said, Viano, you know, um, I'm no longer partner at Search. I'm now partner at OMA. So why don't you come and work for me in Hong Kong? And of course, that was amazing. Um, and that's how my life really changed afterwards. Um, I then went to Hong Kong to work with this man at OMA with Rem Kohas. Um, some people had characterized saying that, you know, working with Rem on architecture is like working with Steve Jobs on a computer. For those of you who might not know the profile of Rem or OMA, as an architect, I can tell you he's got all the awards the Pritzker Prize, the Golden Lion in Venice, you know, Time 100. Uh, but of course, to my clients, I always say he's not only been featured once, but twice in The Simpsons, which I'm sure Rem himself would agree that's even better than a Pritzker Prize. Um, but importantly for architecture students, I think it's to understand what a school OMA is. This article from Metropolis in 2006 shows all the, gen well, at that point, the generation that had come out of OMA. So people that had worked with OMA and then started their own practice. And we can see uh, Neuterlings, we can see Bjarke Ingels, uh, Fernando Romero in Mexico, uh, Ole Sharon, Foreign Office Architects, MVRDB, all at some point were collaborators of OMA. And I think even more important than that, or connected to that is, the philosophy or the theories behind OMA. OMA for a very long time was actually more famous for the stuff they did not build than the stuff they did build. And the stuff they did not build got um, published in these books. It's, a, it's an office that is constantly uh, publishing their thoughts on architecture. No? Many of these books are uh, staples for any architecture's, uh, architect's library. So working for OMA in Hong Kong, I want to show you one a project from OMA before I then jump into my office projects. The five years that I was there from 09 to 2015, uh, 2014, sorry, um, was this, the Taipei Performing Arts Center, which we call TPAC. Here is part of the team that worked on the competition in the Hong Kong office. And here we are celebrating uh, in 09 that we won the competition. But of course, immediately afterwards of celebrating, we panicked because all the stuff that we had to fix. Uh, because of course, in competitions, things are done very quickly. And then you need to really figure out the engineering. And we had a lot of stuff to figure out with this project. A very complex concept. The um, Taiwanese government asked for three theaters with three different specifications of type of theater, type of um, stage, and amount of seating. 
And our concept was to join those three very different theaters with the ability to be uh, independent, but also to be joined in one single theater, which we called the super theater, uh, or actually the super stage. Because when you align these theaters in this cross shape, you get a hundred long meter stage. Here we see the building in section. And that hundred long meter stage allows you to have plays that have never been able to fit inside a theater that are usually done in factory naves or outdoors, now indoors with professional acoustics and climate control. So here we see a sectional model of the project. And once we figured out all the engineering of, you know, removable walls between the different stages, these walls that are massive, that are structural, that are acoustically uh, treated, and they're also fire rated, of course, uh, to be able to then join these stages into the super stage, the uh, construction started. I was uh, mostly involved with the facade and the structure of the project. And be this being a theater, ran would constantly in meetings would reference a past theater of OMA, which in this case you see here in these photos is Casa de Musica in Portugal. And in one meeting in Hong Kong, Rem uh, asked us in the team, which, which was six or seven of us, and said, well, who has been to Casa de Musica? And, you know, there was a Canadian, uh, me, a Mexican, there was two Taiwanese, there was a Russian, an Italian, and an American, and, oh, and a Dutch person. And we all looked at each other and said, well, no, we haven't been to Casa de Musica in Porto. So he looked at us like this, and he's like, how, how is it possible uh, that you want to do OMA's best theater and haven't been to OMA's best theater. So the next week from Hong Kong, he flew us all out to Portugal and gave us a personalized tour of the building, which was, you know, I think my favorite moment of my five years at OMA. It was really special to get to see every single inch of the theater. Uh, we were really like up and down the service elevators and me being the facade guy I was in between the facades, really getting to know every single inch of the project. Now, in development part of the project, once the concept was put through the competition and was elected as a winner, all this development uh, with the facade was very hard work, of course. We had two main facades, the corrugated glass, which we had to get um, the specification right. And it was very difficult because in Casa de Musica, it was done in Spain. And now we had to do it in China. Uh, so I was going back and forth between Hong Kong and Chinese factories to get samples made, to get the corrugation right, to get the angles right, the structure of the glass right, et cetera, et cetera. In Taiwan, being a place where uh, it's an earthquake zone, it had to be able to be earthquake proof. So we had these springs so that when it, there was an earthquake, the glass would move this way and not shatter. So here you see a couple of images of all these samples. Now, we didn't have Zooms back then when this was uh, taking place. So with REM, we would communicate via fax. Now, I don't know who of you has ever sent a fax, but here you can see some of my faxes regarding the facade towards REM and REM's responses. And now the difficult part of the, uh, the fax is that it's in black and white. So if your diagrams uh, explaining the situation with the current state of the building or the questions of your part of the building are not perfect and REM doesn't get it, uh, you're not going to get an answer back. So your part of the building is going to be delayed and you're going to be in trouble. For the metal facade component, as I mentioned, we had a couple of components, the glass corrugated facade and now the huge metal panels. The discussion with Rem was the following. He asked me, he says, do you know our Prada LA store in California? I said, yes. Do you know that this is one single piece of aluminum? And I said, uh, no. And he says, yes, this is one single huge piece of aluminum. I want you to take that piece, fold it, and clad the whole theaters with this. So of course, on the engineering side of this, it was very, very complicated and took actually uh, two years of investigating and talking to engineers and manufacturers to be able to achieve this. And so back and forth, with these kind of drawings, we came up with the idea of these huge 12 meter long pieces with large joints to allow for thermal expansion. Because in Taiwan, of course, you can get, you know, 15 Celsius in the morning and, you know, near to 40 at, in the afternoon. It can be very hot, but it can also be quite cold. 
and this metal needs to expand and it's a seismic zone. This metal needs to move. But we managed to get it done uh, and everybody has an opinion on the facade. So at some point with these little models that I made, we managed to finally pin down how we would do the pattern for the facade. And the pattern of the facade is what you see there today, which are these concentric circles. Now it's a public uh, project. So the contractor had to prove that they were able to make these complicated facades. So here you see in the airport of Taipei, near the airport of Taipei, a one-to-one -one mock-up of the corner of the building, proving that the contractor was able to manufacture this. And here you see the West Towers, which are a fun thing that happens in these studios when you're working very late night. And you know, we would, when there was deadlines, we would work three weeks at a time, going in 11 a.m. and coming out at 3 a.m. And then again next day, 11 to 3 a.m., 11 to 3 a.m., working Saturdays uh, and taking only Sundays off. So at that point, we do so many tests and so many options and everybody has an opinion on the facade and I was in charge of it. So everybody can have an opinion, but I have to draw it. At the end, uh, I decided to not design it at all and just use the AutoCAD hatch pattern and say, look guys, there's no design here. This is a hatch pattern from AutoCAD scaled. And everybody loved it because <laughs> there was no design intent. And that's actually what you see there today. We'll see a picture later. This was the last week that I was involved with OMA, which is December, 2014. And it was the inauguration of the, um, the structure for the project. So there's Rem and the whole team, and there's the mayor and the president of Taiwan. Uh, the whole political team signs that last beam. There's confetti, that beam goes onto the roof and the structure is inaugurated. Here you see a current status of the building, both interior and exterior. Here you see all that cladding from the outside. Uh, this is the Presidium Playhouse, with the, the spherical theater, and that intersection of the two facades, you know, the metal and the glass coming together. The building is set to be open uh, 2022 summer with its first play. And then you see the West Towers with the AutoCAD hatch perforations. Uh, it's very nice to see our model on the right versus the photo of the project and how it's exactly what we were talking about in, in design. No, it's hard to tell which one's which, if only only because one is more blurry than the other one. So that was my experience uh, with OMA. But in my uh, going through this amazing off office studio, and I would say. Uh, um, institution almost of OMA. I went as a junior architect, then became an architect. And the normal procedure would then to be become a senior architect and an associate. But I saw an opportunity to become the business manager and I raised my hand. I wanted to be involved in the business side as well of OMA. And that allowed me to, instead of working on four or six projects in those five years, to work on almost 60 projects because I also got to engage with the clients and uh, craft quotes uh, and look into leads that are not actual projects yet, but might become a project. In that sense, I worked on the business side of getting the project in for uh, Potato Head in Bali, which you might know, uh, with a great organization that is Potato Head and all their FMB and hotel side. And a couple of other Indonesian projects, which I can't speak of because they're still under uh, non-disclosure agreements. I want to just make a mention of this because I thought that this was very important uh, to also learn about the business aspect if you want to have your own office. And that's when I started teaching as well and lecturing. And the first lecture I gave was this one. Joining us tonight, who is nice enough to give me the pronunciation, I am half Mexican, and yet I cannot pronounce this name because I'm bad Mexican that way. Viviano Villarreal from OMA is here to join us tonight. And here you go. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to try to keep this uh, within the allocated time and as interesting as possible. I come from OMA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture. Nobody want to give that, that lecture from the partners uh, in, in, in Hong Kong or the associates because it was a lecture where you had to speak for 10 minutes with a video presentation behind you. So you had to really time it. And nobody was interested in doing that because it's really hard work to put that together. And so they saw that I was not too bad at it and they started giving me more, more public lectures. So I was then traveling to speak about OMA projects, which I would, very much enjoyed. So what happens when you lift it?
It also involved giving bilingual presentations where you speak and then somebody has to translate live in front of you, like that in the Beijing Design Week, which of course, when they ask you to do a one hour presentation, then you have to do a half an hour presentation because the other half an hour is your translations. Uh, but of course, OMA was an amazing experience. Uh, all these presentations, all the work, all the projects, discussions with REM. We had six hour long meetings with REM for, for Taipei Performing Arts Center. It was really amazing getting to go on construction with a project. So not participating only in competitions that were then unfortunately not built, but actually built projects, getting the hard hat on with the OMA logo was a master's degree for me. Now in 2015, I leave OMA and I start my own practice, which was a very ambitious idea. The idea was that a young Mexican architect, young 30 years old, could have a practice in Hong Kong and in Mexico at the same time. And the business model behind this was office of one, me traveling, spending three months in Hong Kong and then three months in Mexico, three months in Hong Kong and then three months in Mexico. And I would tell my clients in Hong Kong, don't worry, I'm always here. And I would tell my clients in Mexico, don't worry, I'm always here. And that first year, 2015, 2016, I traveled 150,000 kilometers going back and forth between Monterrey, Mexico, which is where I'm right now, and Hong Kong which is more or less a 26 hour flight between connections. Uh, if it were Mexico City, it might've been shorter. And a couple of projects in actually India and Europe. Now it also coincided with me teaching. And so actually my first office besides my kitchen counter was this little boat in Hong Kong that would take me from Hong Kong to Macau. And I would teach in Macau with my students and then come back. And so I would use that time in the boat in that little ferry, which was a one hour ride to work on, on the designs that were starting to come in into this office of one person. You know? There are my students. And so that was a, a bit of the life. Uh, then this is a video taken by a, a friend of mine who's a photographer. Uh, ferries, taxis, going to site, kitchen counter, laptop, me really messing up my neck. And then getting after all this work into a plane and going back to Mexico and then doing the same over there, back and forth, back and forth. And in this way, slowly but surely, um, the first interior design project starting taking place. There I am taking the train back to Mexico, back to the flight. The first interior design project starting coming up and eventually the architecture projects. And of course, architecture is slow, very, very slow. So here you see the first projects and five years later, these first projects are starting to be completed, which I'll show a little bit today. We've now grown. The team here is no longer one. We're five. Uh, we're all in home office. So they should be normally next door to me here, but they're all from home. And it's very early over here, <laughs> actually in Mexico right now. So our clients, the name of our office is in English, even though we have projects in Mexico and an office in Mexico, which my colleagues give me a hard time of. But really the name of the office, regardless of what language it is in, it, it speaks about how we see the work in architecture. We try to explain every project through the lens of that as designers, we only have one thing we can work with, which is matter, materials. And so we explain every project through a series of steps, which we call operations, that when applied to that matter, generate space. The philosophy behind this is also generated that we wanna solve problems with these operations, with this architecture, with this design, solving problems, and we cannot solve any problems, or if there are no real problems to solve, then generate opportunities. Sorry for my presentation. If anybody has headphones, you might wanna push down your, uh, your uh, uh, audio settings. So here we get into the practice side of this presentation. And I wanna show a couple of our first projects, uh, which are interior designs in Hong Kong. The first one is this, and here it's really all about showing this problem solving techniques. This is Hong Kong, of course. This is Kowloon. And here we were hired to do uh, a 300 square meter um, interior design for a third generation Indian family, uh, tailoring Indian family. So their private tailoring shop, which is gonna be very VIP only by appointment. But of course, the client wanted to have a huge sign out here. So that meant there was gonna be no natural light into this 300 square meter space. And on top of that, this unit was actually a dual unit, which is two units put together, which means that you are left with a horrible column right in the middle. 
So to deal with this horrible column in the middle, we actually used it in our design. And this became the central point of the design. And we created a sort of forest of columns around it, which we then cut to form our display. This actually helped us divide the shop, which is a tailoring shop between male garments and female garments in a very sort of um, symmetrical way. So here you see the plan and you see the forest of columns being bisected to become displays for their shoes and for the jewelry and different elements that they sell. So here we take a problem, the central column, and we actually work it toward our advantage. So that's how we solve that problem. You've actually forget that there's a column in here. It's really part of the design. Here we see the champagne bar in the back, some of the uh, display spaces. Uh, these are the changing rooms. And it was a, a great first project to get in Hong Kong and a, a really a, an amazing client, which we later then the interior design for their house and a few other projects. But really, that's a commercial project. But really, the projects that really start up the office were the residential projects. And in that case, I'll show you here two lofts, which Indonesia has a very large population. But, you know, yes, there's many islands to it, but it's spread out. Hong Kong, it's 8 million people in a tiny island. It's very, very dense and it's very, very vertical. So when we see these projects, we need to think about that, not just the postcard of Hong Kong, but also the density of Hong Kong. And in that sense, people look for bigger spaces and cheaper spaces. So they go out of the populated areas into industrial spaces. And so then these lofts come into play where people in the corners of the Hong Kong Island are trying to find these spaces where they can rent for cheaper and get bigger, more open space with better views. So this is the plan of our loft. If it doesn't have a mezzanine, it's not really a loft or at least if it doesn't have a double height, it's not really a loft. So here in the section below, you can see it's very simple a staircase to get up to that loft. Um, uh, we have a bed on top and a working space below. Everything else is a living room and a large uh, Japanese style bathroom. You see the project, project in axonometric view. This is the industrial unit as we received it. Those windows overlook the ocean. So it's a beautiful view. It's very overexposed in these bad photos that we took, unfortunately. And so we turn it from this into that. The problem here being that our client was not going to live in it. Our client was going to rent it out to a bachelor. So we designed the space for it to be suitable for a bachelor. There's a full ocean and mountain view. That immediately led to a second loft <clears throat> where we didn't know the user. So in the first one, we had no idea who was going to rent there. Our client said, please design this for a bachelor. And this second loft, it was an artist. And the artist gave us a very specific rules that he wanted to use his space as. He wanted to be able to work, obviously live and sleep, eat, but he also wanted to be able to show off his work and to sell his work. So this was a living space, a workshop, and a gallery. And we all know that art is sold with parties, with openings. So it also was an entertainment space. So here's a plan. Our client did not want to have uh, his bed on the second level. So we only left the space open with no staircases. And we designated between workspace, living space, exhibition space. Here's a small video to show you the process of the work on this loft. Sorry, I clicked something. Here we go. Uh, the work in Hong Kong uh, is amazing and they're very fast workers. Um, and usually one person out of the team spoke English, but actually it was never a problem when I was with all the workers that did not speak English. I should have been speaking Cantonese 
because sketching on the wall really solved any problem uh, on construction. So I really enjoyed all the construction work with these projects. The project was very well published, you know, Arc Daily Design, all the typical suspects for publications. And actually it won a silver medal in the Young Architects Biennale in Mexico, which was kind of very interesting to see uh, a Mexican architect in a Mexican Biennale with a Hong Kong project, no? Um, <clears throat> actually, it was so widely published in 2015, our first year, that we didn't have an Instagram and we started getting messages from our friends saying, Viviano, your project is published on Hypebeast. Now, if you don't know Hypebeast, uh, it's a great blog. Now, although sometimes they really post a lot of stuff about sneakers and rappers, which we like, but we like them more for the industrial and design and art part. And it had 20,000 likes on Hypebeast, which in 2015 in Instagram was insane, yeah? And we didn't have, yes, thank you for the clap. We didn't have an Instagram, so we were not tagged. So immediately we came up with our Instagram, but it was too late. Uh, you can follow our Instagram at Mass Operations. Uh, please follow us there. And if you have any questions, you can send them through there as well. Now, when I moved from interior design into architecture and the stepping stone between interior to architecture for us was pavilions. So here I'm gonna show you two competitions. Uh, it's a competition that is done every year by Alkine, uh, which hosts these uh, conferences in Mexico City called Nextropoli, which are amazing. They, had, they bring 10 speakers from all over the world every year. Of course, now during COVID, it's changed a little bit. And around that celebration of that conference, they uh, design a competition for a pavilion where people visit it. Around 50,000 people visit it and it's active for two weeks. So every year this competition is held. And here I show you two years subsequently that we joined this competition. The concept for this pavilion for us was to connect two plazas with one pavilion. But let me explain that. In the competition, they ask us to design this pavilion with, sorry, the last time I presented this in English was in London, so this is in pounds. Uh, it's 5,000 US dollars. I don't know if somebody in the chat can tell me how much is that in Indonesia? Uh, 5,000 US dollars. That's what we are given to build this pavilion. 75 million Indonesian rupees, right? Rupiah, is it Rupiah? Yeah, was it? Yes. Uh, okay, 75 mil, there we go. So it's not a lot of money to design and build a pavilion. And it's a huge space. This is a site, it's 2,500 square meters next to this beautiful park, next to this beautiful building down here, which we'll see later. And you have to decide, okay, my pavilion is gonna be small because I only have 75 million uh, uh, rupiah. What, where am I gonna put it? In the center, at the end, or the beginning? We're like, that's any option is lame, yeah? Any option is boring. Center, end, or beginning is boring. What would be great is to be able to spread out the pavilion and when you go through it, that you come into contact with these two plazas that we see here, this Northern Plaza and this Southern Plaza, which are actually fairly important plazas in Mexico City. So we said, okay, let's do that. Let's stop calling this a pavilion and let's call it an installation because that's what really we can build with with 75 million rupiah. And we split up the pavilion in 10 door frames. <clears throat> These wooden frames have this plastic, uh, um, they're called Hawaiian blinds actually in Mexico. These plastic blinds that you see sometimes in shops so that you can keep the air conditioning inside. And the thing is that when you see that almost like a, a small kid, you wanna go through it innately. You don't know why. And when you go through one, you'll see nine more. So you'll go through all 10 and that makes you go from one side, from one plaza to another. So with 75 million rupiah, we've done an installation that connects two plazas. Now, hidden underneath these door frames are these mats that are done by this English company that take your steps and the movement of your steps and generate electricity from that. So actually, once you go through it, you would see this screen that had a live number of how many kilowatt hours have been generated by you stepping through. And we know that 50,000 people were gonna step through it. So it was a very easy calculation to make. We would get enough energy for six uh, social homes for one year in Mexico. This is our office um, courtyard. 
So we actually made a little mock-up for this frame and we had a lot of fun with it. It was here for two years until the rain finally demolished it. And, you know, we have these uh, plastic blinds and we would go through it as little kids. We would light it up and had a lot of fun with it. And this is how that frame would look on site. Here we see the renders. And if you see this, I think you'll agree with me that you have to go through it. And once you go through one, you're like, okay, see nine more, I'm invested. I might as well go through all nine and see what's on the other side. And what's on the other side is a screen which just told you, you've just generated this many kilowatt hours by walking from one plaza to another. There we see an aerial view. Now, remember, this is traveling back and forth. So again, the, the boards for this competition were put together while I was, for example, in Vietnam chasing another project. We were finalists, which we were really happy to get shortlisted for this competition, but we were not the winners. And this happens a lot. So guys, go into competitions and guys, you will lose 90% of your competitions. And that's just how architects work, uh, work works, let's say. So that made us come back two years later and try to win this competition. And so we modified our thinking a little bit because something uh, very, very dramatic and very unfortunate happened in between those two years. Se cayeron edificios. Mexico City is built on top of a dry lake. It was dried out by the Spanish conquistadors. So it's terrible, terrible ground to have large buildings. in. And when there's an earthquake, not even near Mexico City, it can be really hundreds of kilometers away from Mexico City, Mexico City shakes. And in that year, on the 30th anniversary to the day of the largest earthquake in history, which was in 1995, there was a huge earthquake in Mexico City. Now, I don't live in Mexico City, but I was there that day because I was presenting another project. And I had not slept the night before preparing the presentation for that competition. I presented. The two other architects after me, their presentation got canceled because of the earthquake. I was sleeping in my apartment and then spent seven hours uh, in the, uh, in the, on the streets before it was okay to go back into the apartments. Thankfully, for myself and my friends and the people that I know in Mexico City, nothing happened to them and their properties. But it was a very scary thing. And also, it was a very um, important thing for this competition proposal. Now, that also meant that I lost my flight back to Hong Kong, which meant I gave my first online class back then, which, of course, now we're doing every single day. So how things change. My students were not very happy to get me online that day. So we thought there was nothing we could speak about except for this. The, the earthquake. And we took this building, which is sort of like the Hagia Sophia of Mexico, because this building has survived every single earthquake in Mexico. And it's a beautiful and iconic building. And what we did was to break it. So we did this model of this famous building in Mexico in clay, and then we broke it. And then all those fragments of this demolished building, because we're trying to simulate an earthquake, we then scanned in 3D. So here you see those pieces being scanned. And then instead of just putting them here, which is a site for the competition, we throw them all throughout the park. As we throw them on the park, we apply a little Maya plugin, which pixelizes them and creates these little boxes. What happens is that it loses its identity. If you remember from the beginning of the, of the uh, uh, lecture, I spoke about objects that have a use. And when you take away the use, it becomes a piece of art. Well, a building has a use. Walls, keep up uh, uh, slabs, columns and beams keep up the building. When you take away the use of the building as it's demolished, it becomes a piece of art. But we just help the appreciation of that fragment of a demolished building with this little plugin to actually really become a, a, a sculptural element. So these sculptures are then presented to you in this way all throughout the park, very in your face sometimes, or a little bit more hidden, and you have to actually go and seek them out. But when they present themselves to you, you don't know what they are until you get close to them and you kind of go into the QR code and you read into a little bit of how, 
you read a little bit into how the presentation, the, the uh, work was made, you understand that this is a fragment of that building potentially demolished, which is called Palacio de Bellas Artes, the Beaux-Arts Palace. And so it reminds you that you are living in a seismic zone and you need to have a plan in place. You know, uh, having a flashlight, batteries, an extra phone, water, etc. So the actual pavilion doesn't happen afterwards because uh, uh, Mextropoli wants you to design a pavilion that is recycled afterwards. So it's like, we don't not, we're not going to recycle these sculptures. We're actually going to put them together. And when you put them together, then they really become a pavilion. And that pavilion is an info point, which is then five info, info points are placed throughout the city. And then they live out their lives, educating people on how to be prepared for the next earthquake. Here you see, which is behind me in those acrylic boxes, the model, both the 3D print and which is based on and the clay demolished model, which is really one of my favorite projects in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the office. We thought that this was even a more interesting proposal than the one that we had done two years prior. However, we were not even shortlisted. And guys, that's a big lesson here. That's how architecture works. Um, so I want to wrap up with two projects and then I'll talk a little bit about classes and then we'll, we'll finish up. I know I've got 60 minutes. Novi, I might go 10 minutes after, uh, over, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay, take your time. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So we saw interior design in Hong Kong, two pavilions in Mexico City. Now I'll show you two architecture projects in Monterrey, which is the north of Mexico. Here the problem was that the client wanted a lot of square meters for their house and it just didn't all fit in the plot of land. Now it was a very large plot of land, but what they wanted was a lot. And we sort of tried to solve this through a very specific uh, concept, which is, can we try to make this house appear to float? Because what happens when you have a large floor plan is that you get away from the uh, spaces where natural light can come in. So the bigger your floor plan, the darker its center gets. So we lift up, the second floor to allow to natural light come in. And in this idea of lifting the second floor to let natural light in, we also thought about this, which is Rem's, one of Rem's first houses, which its concept is very complicated. It involves taking Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie and sectioning it and flipping it and using all the whole uh, kind of a collage technique into it. But it also involved having a building that overlooks sort of in a way floats to see uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And we, saw, we thought it would be very interesting, well, I thought it would be very interesting to try to tackle that same concept. Can a house appear to float? So we took the block of the house, the total massing of the square meters that the client wanted, and we carve out a staircase, this is why it's called the stair house, and lift up that second floor. And by doing that, and with our experience with lofts in Hong Kong, we realized that there was an opportunity. So here we're solving a problem to that natural light into this very deep floor plane. But then we see the opportunity to allow for a mezzanine space to take place, which actually at the time the client was not very interested in, but we put it in anyway. They're like, what are we gonna use a mezzanine for? We're like, trust us, you'll use it. And that's the project. Uh, now, as I explained earlier, the advantage of lifting the second floor is to let all the natural light come in. So this deep floor plate is all naturally lit. Whereas typically these houses that have very deep floor plates, it's noon and you walk in and you have to turn on the lights. So that doesn't happen here. Here we see a section through the, through the house. We see how this double height um, kitchen with the, there you see Martha Stewart, which is a famous cook. I don't know if you know her. Well, chef, sorry, not cook. Uh, we see the living room space, which has a, a party piece is that on top of what we did with the heights here, we allowed for the structure to be separated 17 meters to allow for the whole living room to be open to the garden space. So here we see those glass doors sliding open to allow for the interior living space to be communicated with the garden. This would be impossible without our collaboration with our engineers, our structural engineers. Uh, Nobi, you come from the structural side and the civil engineering side. So I think you might appreciate this. Stephen Melville is a great engineer. You can also follow him, Format Engineers, his Instagram account. They do amazing things. And Stephen said, you know, this idea of opening these glass doors is fine, but what will happen to your floor slab is this. And so to fix that, you need to use uh, a truss. 
But a truss here, as we see it here, sorry, these slides are the other way around. Other way around. It's going to be too thick uh, and too expensive. So we're going to lighten the load of this truss by using the dividing walls between the three rooms and the second floor as floor to ceiling beams, actually, pulling back the center of this truss so it lightens the load. And so we did that to correct our structural, let's say, ideas together with these very, very small diameter columns. These are 20, 20 centimeter uh, diameter columns. So very, very small, as you can see in my hand there, but they have a very thick structural, uh, um, I forgot the word, but they're very thick structurally, let's say. Um, structural depth is the right word I'm looking for. And so we solved the engineering, we did the construction documents and we began construction. And it's not typical in this part of Mexico to see a whole house being built in and steel. And it's like being in a circus to see these things come up. It's really a performance. So much though that we had to put a, a, a rendering of the building because the neighbors thought that this was a commercial development next to their house. And they were really, really uh, stressed out. Here we see the living room spaces taking place. Uh, this man is not very tall, but it can help you to see, you know, the proportions of this double height space, which is the living room. We start uh, putting the concrete in for the bridges that are connecting the mezzanine from one side to another. Here you can see that truss in the background. There you see the views from the house. We have the Sierra Mountains back there. And just like the steel goes up, the board, the 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 Formwork for the concrete starts coming off, which is also a delight to see always, especially in this form in the time lapse. No? There's a living room space taking shape. Uh, it's bridge that gives, gives it scale. And how this box really seems to be looming and floating on top of the other one. Now, because of the pandemic, the, the family moved in earlier than they should have, uh, which was fine by us, but complicated to finish the interior. So here you see the staircase, the staircase not finished yet. And some of the interior space is still bare. We have not finished the project interior wise, so we don't have the final projects, uh, project photos yet. But I'll show you a few of the um, latest images. Here we see those bridges where we had fun and left some glass spaces to show the section of the connection plan underneath how the interior always goes out to the exterior and this sort of tabula rasa where from street to garden, you have the entry of um, natural light all through the house. Now, again, because of the pandemic, these doors have not arrived yet from Spain. It's taking a long time with COVID, but uh, we hope to get them within one or two months now. That's the current status of the project. Still not completely finished. Hope to get photos soon. Now, I wanna end the architecture side with this project, uh, which is our largest project uh, to date, which is the headquarters of a, a very well-known pharmaceutical company in Mexico. This was a complicated project because for their headquarter building, our client wanted a tower. And when we saw their site, uh, we said, sorry guys, uh, there's no point doing a tower here. Because if you do a tower, the only thing that you'll do is do a massive facade towards the west sun, which is terrible. And you'll have your whole team of 500 employees completely discommunicated from each other. And that's not what you want in a headquarter office. So here's a little video that explains this concept for you. It is in Spanish, but I have English subtitles for you. En un principio cuando nos llega este proyecto a la oficina, nos llega como una torre de oficinas. Y claro que como arquitectos a todos nos gusta la idea de proyectar grandes edificios. Pero ya que tuvimos tiempo de analizar el proyecto y el sitio, nos dimos cuenta que hacer una torre de oficinas aquí sería un gran error. 
ya que lo único que estaríamos haciendo es proyectar una gran fachada hacia el sol del poniente de Monterrey. Además, este edificio de oficinas no es uno común y corriente donde hay muchos renteros, sino es un edificio donde hay un solo equipo trabajando en conjunto. Por lo tanto, analizamos las necesidades del cliente para este proyecto y encontramos que había tres aspectos muy importantes que mantener. Uno es que todos los pisos estuvieran muy bien comunicados. El segundo es que creáramos espacios para hacer colaboración espontánea posible. Y tercero, era que en ningún momento un empleado prefería tomar el elevador que subir escaleras para irse de un piso a otro. Entonces comenzamos con un volumen largo y bajo, el cual al levantarse se protege con una fachada de Luber hacia el sol del poniente. Ese mismo volumen en planta lo abrimos desde su centro para así recibir toda la luz del norte, la cual es la mejor luz de trabajo. De tal manera, acabamos con un proyecto bajo, compacto, muy sustentable, muy bien comunicado, en el cual desde su primero hasta sus últimos de sus niveles lo podemos navegar por medio de escaleras. Y es ahí, en esas escaleras, donde se dan los momentos de colaboración espontánea. Okay, um, so there you saw the concept of the building. It's a building that's working really hard to accomplish different things on the different parts of the site. It's really reacting to its different parts of the site. It has a pharmacy on one side, which is their test pharmacy for the, all their new projects. It has an urban access on one side, car entry, a public plaza up on the north side. And as you saw, the plan gets bifurcated into this sort of V or A shape form to allow for um, the northern light to come in and it completely blocks itself with metallic louvers to the west to block that western sun. And that western sun blocked off on this side here creates actually a shadow for this side. So you only have to use half of the louvers for two facades. Um, let me clear my drawings. And this series of staircases and ramps and electric staircases culminated up in the roof garden, which is a 800 square meter roof garden where everybody can access. The whole idea is for uh, people in this building to prefer to use staircases and ramps than elevators. I think anybody that's had to wait for an elevator can tell me that there's nothing more boring than waiting for an elevator, right? And it connected with the idea of this being a pharmacy and health wise for people to move up staircases rather than wait for elevators. So here we see a couple of photos of the construction, how it's built in two halves, two wings. The bridges start connecting these two wings. And eventually... There we saw the 24 hour process of uh, pouring on site that stair ramp, which has a ramp in the middle of it, like a Z-shaped form. There we see it in plan. There we see that roof garden. Um, 
These are maybe two month old photos. We just flew a drone yesterday. We're going to be posting those pictures soon. Uh, we're really excited about this project. You see the fifth floor, which is angled to get that beautiful view of it's called the Huasteca Mountains into the building. That's, of course, the west. Um, had we done this flat roof, we would have completely chopped off the top of this mountain. This is a lobby where we have these continuing staircases and these informal working spaces that are continued throughout the building until you get up to the rooftop. You see the process for the construction of the facade, the northern view of the building. And again, it's really reacting to every single corner of its very urban condition. Uh, and during the day, the building really changes again towards every single condition that it has. From day to night, the connecting bridges. Here we see the louvers in action. This is summer, 4 p.m., west side, completely in the shade inside. So the louvers really working. Um, the client at some point went to Valley Engineer, engineer them out and take off half of the louvers. And I said, if you take half of the louvers, you might as well take them all away because then the sun really will come in. They trusted me somehow and they believed in me and, and it's so far it's, it's worked out. There we see the public part of the building being ex exposed and communicated by the facade. So that here is the, let me draw it one second. Here's the lobby space. And this is the um, restaurant or the cafe for the whole, um, the whole team, which are 500 employees here. That's the Northern Plaza and the entrance to the pharmacy. So in May, no, sorry, no, that was originally. In June, the team will start to move in from their different offices in the state into this one single building. With all the COVID things put in place, we're designing a special COVID entrance here where if your temperature uh, is above a certain amount, the doors will not open. It's very black mirror, I'm afraid, but of course we have to take all the precautions nowadays with our current situation. And again, a reminder, remember that little boat from Hong Kong to Macau while I was teaching, that was my office? You can see here, I knew this was gonna be an important moment. This is when the final plans were being drawn for the concept of this building, which was in, in its time a competition, of course. And that's why I wanna conclude the second part only to get to the third part, which will be very quick, and we get to hopefully a good discussion in Q&A about uh, what I do with my students in academia. So connecting back uh, to what I mentioned about this discussion between Serra and Piano about art, I use cinema uh, a lot to connect with my students so that we can discuss architecture through the lens and through the process of cinema, because cinema is very much in your grasp and architecture is so difficult to define well cinema is not and you turn on the tv and there it is and it can be easily discussed and then we're not discussing your work or my work we're discussing somebody else's work which is not an architect and so, as piano says it's about telling stories so cinema is about telling stories and i tell you this little story when gary met uh this famous director Sidney pollock in los angeles gary being a young bad boy considered himself an artist he insulted in this dinner, uh, Sydney saying, well, you're a Hollywood director, you're commercial stuff, you're not an artist. All you care is about just making money for your investors in your movies and your movies are about nothing really interesting, just stuff that makes money. And Sydney says, wait, wait, wait a minute, Frank. Yes, I have my investors. Yes, there's rules to my movies. Yes, I need to make a profit. But out of that whole discussion, there's a 10% of it that is completely mine. And that's where my art is. And I have full reign of that 10%. And so allegedly, Frank Gehry then at night gave him a call and said, look, I want to apologize. I thought about this. And actually, it's exactly the same in architecture. Because yes, we have municipality and state and nationwide rules. We have fire codes. We have budgets. When it's for a developer, the building needs to make money. So it's exactly the same. I have 10% left for my art. You're right. And I want to apologize. And that's the key thing. In cinema as well, you can see it, that in architecture and cinema, we can think about that at least 10% of the whole building needs to be our art. And the easiest way to attack that is through narrative, to telling a story. Um, so the, the reason why I show this... The way to draw it is as a hairpin, like that. 
The reason why I show this is because this is one of my favorite directors, Christopher Nolan, and he's for half an hour trying to explain what the movie Memento was about. And nobody gets it. It's a complicated movie. And then he realizes, wait a minute, I can just draw a diagram and explain the movie. And in five seconds, he draws for the first time a diagram that explains a super complicated plot of a movie. And so we do that with my students. We do graphic stories. We explain complicated movies through very simple diagrams that show something that you were not able to understand just by simply seeing the movie, but you have to analyze through an image that is measurable. Yeah, so here in Memento, for example, how many times a tattoo or a Polaroid or one of Leonard's notes, if you haven't seen the movie, you should watch it, come into play. And so we see these beautiful images that actually tell us the story of the movie. Uh, and we need to do that in architecture because if you remember from that first discussion, ideas are communicated through drawings and architecture. So if you're able to take a complex idea in your head and to translate it in that into a drawing that is simple to understand, that tells a story and it's beautiful, you're going to be successful, yes? So we use this also into telling stories of cities. I teach a, a class that has to do with urban design, designing a city. And so before we get into actually designing a real city, we look at fake cities that are shown in movies. And cities, we understand them as inhabitable spaces. So here we see the spaceship for Space Odyssey 2001. And we tell a story of what's going on in this, in this place. Or Blade Runner. And here through one axonometric drawing, we tell a story of the movie of Blade Runner, the original one from 1982. We read books and we tell the story of, of city shown in a book. So here we see Plato's Atlantis and so on and so on. We use this also for non-fictional cities. So here, when we went into COVID, I gave a class where we visualized the city post-pandemic. How is that going to look? We speculated. So we took one axonometric drawing of our city, Monterrey, Mexico, and with students tackled nine different topics. So here you see my students, and here you see one drawing, which we divided into nine different squares, and each pair of students attacked that city part and changed it, viewing the future of the city post-COVID. And that would be from how is going to uh, apartment living change, how, is gonna be, how are the sidewalks going to change, how is transportation going to change? So that's what you see from here to here. And we got really beautiful reviews and commentary from, you know, people like Colin Fournier and uh, Oscar Grauer. And I'm going to finalize with this, which was my thesis uh, in SciArc. I, 10 years later after graduating, went into my master's degree. And I saw a problem in academia. <clears throat> and the problem for me is that I think architecture schools everywhere, everywhere have great plans, academic plans, curriculums for educating architects, but terrible plans for educating entrepreneurs. We're not being taught how to start an office and how to lead an office and generate money in an architecture office. So this studio takes a class, which is called the professional practice class, which teaches you about RFPs, RFQs, what's called the business of design. Um, and these very boring things about contracts and puts all that information, which is usually a very bland PowerPoint with, you know, aerial typeface number 10, huge blocks of text, which nobody wants to read into a studio design format class and into a competition format. So uh, look at this stat from all the offices that ever are uh, started in the US, 50% of them don't get to be five years old. And from those that did survive their five first years, which we're now in our sixth six year, so we're doing okay, <laughs> we're happy. 77% of those don't make it to their 10th year. So these are your survivors down here. Oh, sorry. That's terrible statistics. So with this class, which instead of working in groups, you work in offices. You get together with three people, you put together your three portfolios and you make an office name. You work in this office. I give you fake money. This is the printouts. I have them here. I'll show you one later of this fake money at the beginning of the class. And there's no grades. Everything is money. So every week I take away from you money, which is salary, expenses, and rents. And every assignment, which are real life competitions that are given to you out of the whole office is working together, only one wins and gets a money uh, prize. 
So if you don't win assignments throughout the class, you're going to end up bankrupt without money, which is what happens to offices. And this class was actually taught and it won um, as a thesis, the best thesis for 2019. And I'll finish by showing you a very little video, very small video of this first class that it was taught because I had to videotape it all like if it was Big Brother to then be able to show it at Soyark as proof of this class and my thesis statement. Okay, the video goes on and on and on. We can talk about it later. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. And really, again, thank you again for the invitation. And I hope we can have a, a nice discussion. I went a little bit over time. I hope it wasn't too much. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much for a very insightful and uh, interesting presentation. Now, uh, just to be quick, I will read some questions that uh, some of the students here already uh, posted in the Google form. We have uh, two questions. First questions from Samuel Edison Halomwan from Architecture ITS. Um, when you are designing or when you are planning a project, do you go wild with the concept and make a project the way you concept it? Or do you plan your project with the engineer and how to build it in mind? Because in one point, we as architects want our building to be the way we want. In this case, in Indonesia, the ability of engineers uh, and the workers are not that advanced. And sometimes even if it will, the cost will be pretty high. No, we collaborate all the time. I think this is a very important aspect that you're speaking to. Um, I showed there the collaboration in this case with Stephen Melville, which is our structural engineer. Uh, we try to collaborate with the best people possible. While I was with OMA, I got to know, I think, the best engineers in the world. You know, uh, Acom, Atkins, Arup, all these huge engineering companies have amazing people. And then sometimes people like them leave and start their own smaller outfits. So, for example, Stephen Melville was a director of structure in Ramble, which is a Norwegian engineering firm. And they started his own firm in, in London. We want to collaborate with engineers at the beginning. Um, and depending on who we're collaborating with, the discussion goes in different ways. Sometimes we can really just say, look, this is the problem here. This is our idea. How do you think this can be achieved? And they'll come back to us and they say, well, this could be done this way. And then this back and forth enriches the project. So in that example I showed you, it's very straightforward. He said, uh, Stephen, we want to do a 17 meter span. How do we do this? And he helped us visualize that. But in larger projects, <clears throat> it gets much more complicated. So actually the discussion is much more um, dual instead of just us asking the question and them giving us the answer. It's a collaboration. That's really what it's about. Now, unfortunately, collaborations can be expensive. And at the beginning of the project is when there's least money from the client side, yeah? There's a lot of money for construction and there's a lot of money for documentation most of the times. But at the beginning, nothing's really in place. So if you start saying, hey, look, I want to bring in five engineers to work on this, they're going to say, sorry, you can bring them, but we're not going to pay for them. And we're going to pay for you like this much. So as a young architect, it's hard to collaborate at the beginning with uh, big engineering firms. And in that sense, it's really important to then establish uh, 
good working relationships. The fee that Stephen charged us for the stair house, which made it possible, was minuscule. He really charged 10% of what he should have charged any client. But we had built up a relationship while I was working at OMA. And that's really important. And he's collaborated with us in several projects. And, and he's really a very important asset to the office and in most of our projects. Uh, now, collaboration at the end is also really important when you're in construction, because there's this thing called value engineering. So budgets were mentioned. Buildings are designed, documented, and then construction starts and there's design changes. Things happen. Economies change. Um, clients might have more money sometimes or less money sometimes. Steel prices go up, concrete goes up, and then you need to make changes. And in that sense, you need to be able to work with someone where you can sit down and say, look, this part of the building was structured in steel. The price of steel just went up. We need to change it now to masonry. We need to change it to concrete. How can we do this? And make sure that the changes to the building make it better, or at least keep its original intent or concept. Dial engineering is usually done also to say, look, we're gonna, this part of the building is too expensive. How can we make it cheaper? There's a great book by Richard Neutra called Cheap and Light, which is Richard Neutra and Frank Lloyd Wright talking about how to make buildings cheap and light. Uh, structure in buildings is calculated by their weight. It's how many kilograms of steel is in your building. I see Novi saying yes, because she's from the structure side. Uh, the famous uh, quote from Buckminster Fuller towards uh, Sir Norman Foster was, Mr. Foster, do you know how much your building weighs? And Norman did not know. And it's really important because more kilograms is more money. Does the concept uh, need those kilograms? Can we make it cheaper and lighter and keep the same concept? So collaboration is really important. And we try to do it as, as much and as often as possible. And I also show collaboration with the client is really important. I show this image often in, in my presentations to my students, which is these um, rock grinders where you put in like three really ugly rocks into this grinder and you leave it a week grinding away. And after a week, you open it up and you take the rocks out and there are these beautifully polished, almost like gem-like stones. That's collaboration. It's punches and punches and punches over and over again. But at the end, the final product is what you're going for. And you need to be able to go through that, those weeks of punches to come out on the other side. So collaborations are also tough. Yes, thank you very much for amazing explanation. And another question, or maybe from the, uh, from Samuel Edison, if you have like more uh, feedback, you can type it in the chat box. And for the next question from Waudia Nurul Jasmin Azara Budiman from Urban and Regional Planning. The question is, what is your opinion about the relationship between architecture and urban morphology? And how do you consider the surrounding sociocultural aspect when you design a building? I mean, that's a very broad question, but I can, I can perhaps give a couple of comments. I was at a lecture with um, Patrick Schumacher, uh, the business partner and associate, and well, no, the partner in Saha Hadid Architects, partner next to Saha. And, you know, I love Saha's work. Saha, since I was a student, was a, a, a hero of mine. But when it comes to master planning, the projects that come out of that studio, not all of them, some of them, I'm really critical of. Now, the thing is that master planning and urban planning takes, if I said in the presentation that architecture is slow, master planning is really, really slow. It's a slow moving iceberg. Um, so it takes a long time to see the results of these huge urban plans being put into place. And it takes a large, uh, movement of different profession, it takes politics. It takes a lot of money to put these plans into place. And you know, political parties last sometimes at the local level two years or three years. At the you know, republic level, sometimes only six years. And then another party comes in and changes the plan. And so the initial plan gets changed and nobody knows what to do anymore. It's very complicated. So the criticism to, towards these projects that I don't agree with and Saha Hadid 
is not the only studio that does this, but there is a trend in this, is to look at the city from a bird's eye perspective and design through that. And we don't live in planes, right? We live on the ground. Of course, there needs to be a global concept and there needs to be a perspective from up there to be able to understand it. So this beautiful plan from Lucio Costa of the city of Brasilia, which takes this concept of an airplane of two main axes, and from that, the whole city springs up. And these Le Corbusier models in India, Chandigarh, for example, we have to understand that when these buildings, well, when these cities were designed, there was nothing there. Brasilia was, a, the city did not exist. It was a jungle. They moved the capital city there overnight and they need to build the city. Most of the time we're doing urban planning, we're doing urban planning uh, on top of layers of pre-existing city. Uh, so we, if we talk about that, we need to kind of learn what happened with Jane Jacobs and Moses in New York, uh, which I think has gone maybe a little bit overhead because now we have, of course, the problems of gentrification. So we cannot only look at the city from above as an urban planner. We need to look at it from the floor level as well. We cannot only design a, a pretty urban plan that looks like it's all done in Maya. We need to really understand how the city works at the floor level. Everybody talks about this, the smart city. And you know, most people, if you go on the streets and tell them, do you know what a smart city is? They'll say, well, a city that has a lot of Wi-Fi." But the most basic definition of a smart city is a city that spends little money. So if I look at a busy intersection, instead of having stoplights and I use a roundabout, the people there, the flow of cars, will be faster, people will get to their businesses sooner, there's gonna be less fuel use, there's less contamination, that's a smart city intervention. So I think I would say those two things. We cannot look at the city only from the bird's eye perspective. Uh, we need to know what are the limits of gentrification when we intervene a city, because there is pre-existing things that we need to respect. In with the old, in with the new, how to connect those two sides. And we need to take the idea of revenue flows, economies, um, ecological flows, seriously, and this whole discussion of uh, smart city planning. Okay, thank you very much. And another, another question. Uh, there is another one question uh, from Tritan Sanur. Uh, from Architecture IPS. What is the most important aspect for you when you start to do your project and deciding your idea? Well, first of all, every time I, there's a new project, I get really scared and I try to not work on it. <laughs> uh, I don't understand why. The best I can think about it is this, there's this word called procrastination. When you, you know you have to do something and you just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. Sometimes it's like, you know, looking at the bills at the end of the month, I, I just really don't want to look at the bills. But that's the same way I feel sometimes of a new project. And so I'll, I'll start deleting the files on my desktop and organizing files. I'll start cleaning up my office. I usually, when I start a new project, it's going to be in the weekend. I do, you know, the patio, I'll clean the leaves before <laughs> I get into the zone and start designing. And I think it is, you have to create an environment to start to design. You have to be at peace. Design only comes from a, a, a place of love. You know, you cannot design a building or a house or a piece of the city for someone that you hate. It's really a, an act of love. You, you're trying to give your best response for that person or that client or that group of people and say, look, I think this is the best thing you could do for your project. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be the best project in the world. There's, gonna, there's many designers that are more talented than I am. But within my head, this is the best that I can give you. And to be able to do that, it takes a lot of energy from you. And it, it's very sincere energy in that response to be able to do the best for your client. In that sense, you want to have an uncluttered space, an uncluttered mind to be able to sit down and design. The most important thing for me when I sit down and design, when I do do that, when I finally clean my desk and my PC desktop and the leaves in the patio, the two things that I said when I explained the name of my office. Solve a problem 
or generate an opportunity. So there's a lot of investigating. We investigate the program of the client, the headquarter office. They wanted a tower. We said, guys, you think you want a tower, but you don't. In reality, you want your team to be all in the same floor plan. Of course, with your site, it's impossible. But let's try to make that possible. So we did only five levels instead of the 20 that they wanted. They wanted a symbol. And we said, look, your building is going to be a symbol regardless of what we do. It doesn't have to be a tower to be a symbol. But what you want is your team connected, not separated like a hamster. Yeah, a hamster is, you know, it's in there, it's wheel, it goes down, it goes into the subway and it goes up to another wheel and it comes back. We don't want that. We want our teams, financial team, uh, accounting team, research and development, all to be connected and not have to go up and down elevators in 25, 30 stories. And through this narrative, we managed to convince our clients that hired us for a tower to not give them a tower, which I thought was really impressive. Um, and so solving problems or generating opportunities is the most important thing when we're designing. And through our investigation, we will find those problems. In this case, the idea that they wanted a tower and the opportunities, generating a public space, creating a garden, responding to the different parts of the sites. These things through our work start kind of coming up as like interesting points where we tackle them with design and we solve all these problems through design. Okay. So for the people who already asked, if you have like uh, feedback, you can uh, put it in the chat box. Now, uh, move to the next question. Uh, uh, this question is from Stefan Kenter. Uh, from H HZ, University of Applied Sciences in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. What is the reason modern architecture these days looks boring? <laughs> Comparing the architecture of today to historical building, modern buildings don't, don't stand out. Also, the lifetime of modern buildings is shorter than historical buildings. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yes, uh, great, great comments and great question. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a little second here because I want to show an image. I'll get to that image in a bit. I'll tackle first the, the idea of uh, how long buildings last. The length of a life of a building is directly related to the money that that building costs. If we look at antiquity, let's say Egypt, we have the pyramids. Those pyramids were built in red granite. And that's what we see today. They were covered in beautiful limestone. Beautiful limestone was then, then pillaged. So people would start taking it away and using it for their own buildings. We have the red granite left because it's super hard. The houses of the people, the normal common family, lived in mud brick houses. You don't see them. Mud break, it rains after a while, it's gone. The roofs were with wood and thatched. So that's vegetable roofs, gone. We see antiquity in Rome. From the antiquity in Rome, we have ruins of these old government buildings and temples made all in marble. So what I'm saying is that marble, granite, expensive. Mud bricks, vegetable roofs, cheap. Some last, some don't. Now, in modern times, buildings are not designed to last for thousands of years. They have a, a useful life, and then they are reappropriated. Actually, the most interesting spaces nowadays come in from reappropriation of buildings that were used for something else. And the buildings are modified. In OMA, I forget the name of the project now, but we worked in a, in a project that was in Jakarta about taking these old uh, factory naves and turning them into cultural centers. Yeah. So buildings, uh, what, it's very romantic to think about designing a building saying this building will last forever. And, you know, in 2000 years when, you know, a civilization from Mars comes here and sees the ruins, they'll see the work of this architect. It doesn't really work that way. That can happen for sure. Buildings can have a long life, but we're not kind of, that's not our main goal. Now, if we look at Louis Kahn's work, Louis Kahn was really much uh, uh, enthralled by these old 
Roman and Egyptian ruins. It's in his sketches. And he wanted to design buildings that had that monumentality of these ruins that seemed that they had always been there. So when we look at the buildings, like for example, in India from Khan, or the assembly in Dhaka, or the Salk Institute, these concrete buildings will last a very long time. And they're built with these materials, concrete and travertine, that will last a very long time. This is not cheap. And the design of them is ethereal. If you see a Khan building, it will never look out of date. It's atemporal. And atemporality is a good quality to have in your building. Otherwise, it falls out of fashion. When you want to be at the top of the design ladder with the latest design movement, let's say, or trend, there is a potential pitfall that you can fall out of trends. Yeah? And that, that can happen. And it's very uh, respectable to try to chase the newest trend. And it's also very respectable to try to stay away from the trends. What I don't want to do is to look back and replicate what's in, in the history, right? For me, history is always a reference. Um, I forget now with all these conferences, but I think I was asked last night, uh, does it get easier to be an architect as you start building more and more? It actually gets harder because every little building or project that you finish stands there as a testament of saying, hey, the next one needs to be better. You know that, right? For me to be okay, my next brother needs to be better than me. Otherwise, it's weird. So with each new project, the responsibility grows on top of you. And that's also why you need to start taking more and more time with each project, because then you need to start building up your portfolio and, 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 and evolving as an architect yourself. Now, I just want to finish about the boring side of architecture. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Banksy, uh, the artist from the UK that nobody really knows who he is. And I think there's a couple of, uh, of graffitis attributed to him. So I'll show here quickly, uh, Google image search. I don't, I'm not sure if this is his or not, but this allegedly is his, where he graffitied saying boring. I think we need to do better as architects in communicating, yes? What our buildings are about. Telling the stories behind our buildings, like Piano says, so to give that building soul, yes? If you go take a tour from any of these ancient cities and just look at the buildings, they have these story innately in them. But if you talk to a historian and he tells you a couple of stories behind these buildings, what happened in that street corner? What happened in that piazza? What happened to that facade? It got demolished and then rebuilt. It was first a church, then it's a mosque. Now it's a museum. These things come to life. And if as architects, we don't communicate what we're thinking behind our, our, our buildings and what they stand for, then we leave the citizenship or the citizenry out of that discussion. And they need to be part of that discussion. And I think we need to be better at communicating that. And of course, there's gonna be good buildings and there's gonna be bad buildings. And that's part of it. Now, if you seem to think that there's more and more boring buildings, do something about it. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Vigiano, for your uh, amazing presentation and insightful um, elaboration. And thank you also for your valuable time. Uh, I really hope to see you again in the future, maybe when you visit Indonesia for your upcoming project. Yeah. So yeah, everyone, we are already at the end of our session. So as a moderator, I also would like to thank all the participants who have been very actively involved in the session. And uh, now I am passing the virtual mic microphone back to the master of ceremony, Fifi. Okay, thank you very much for Professor Fabiano and for the excellent lecture today. And thank you so much for Ibu Novi for conducting this amazing session. Please give applause to our speaker and moderator by using the Zoom reaction feature. Okay, furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to our speaker and also our moderator today. This is the certificate presented. Okay. 
we were the main. Yeah, we would like to present the certificate awarding. There we go. This is the certificate presented for Professor Viviano Villarreal Bueron. Mm. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and the certificate also presented for Ibu Novi. Thank you very much. Once again, once again, thank you very much for Professor Viviano Villarreal Bueron and Ibu Novi for availability on today's Get Lecture, Get Lecture series. We believe that your lecture will be useful for all the participants. Thank you so much. If I can, can I just conclude with one small thought? Is okay, it possible? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not sorry, not to interrupt. Just didn't want to just say bye. Again, really thank you all for the invitation. And Nobi, thank you for the wonderful moderating. Vivi, I love my that we pleasure. have almost this. Yeah, my pleasure. Vivi, I, I love that we have almost the same name. <laughs> uh, it's not a very common name in Mexico. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm meant to be back in Hong Kong in June. I have to do a 21 day quarantine in, in Hong Kong. So we'll see how that goes. But I would love to collaborate uh, with your institution if there's any opportunities, if any other lectures or even a workshop would be great. And again, it's an honor to be with you guys. It's been, I think, four years since I lectured in Asia, and I was really excited for this uh, presentation. It's getting bright over here, and the sun's starting to rise. And again, uh, thank you. If, you. if you guys have any other questions, want to reach out to me, you can always find me in my social media, which is Mass Operations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Viviano, for your closing remark. Okay, everyone, before we end our lecture today, we invite you all the participants as well as the honorable speaker and moderator to take a group photo. To all participants, please turn on your camera. Oh, this is a great idea. I like this. <laughs> Let me hide the chat. There we go. Okay. As we have uh, two slides here, please keep your smile and until we finish the photo sessions. For the first slide, okay, please turn on your camera. I'm going to count one, two, three. The next slide. One, two, three. And the last slide, the last slide, one, two, three. Love it. Now we have finished the group photo. Then for the participant, please fill the feedback link through the, uh, through the Zoom chat box at bit.ly slash feedback gls then you can also see on the zoom chat room the deadline for the filling the feedback of the feedback form is one hour after two decisions we want to remind you again that the participant who will get the same is that the participant who come on time join this event until the end of the event also fill the feedback form finally we have reached today's session of guest lecture series, and we sincerely apologize for any mistake we might have made in presenting as Master of Ceremony and Committee. Thank you so much for our honorable speaker today and moderator and all the participants for the attention and cooperation. We will see you in the next guest lecture series on SDGs next week. We will have a session on next Wednesday on 5th of May. The speaker will be Associate Professor Nadia Tulhuda Zufikli from University of Technology Malaysia with the topic Passive Optical Access Network and its present development.
I think this is the end of the today's session. Thank you so much for Professor Viviano and Ibu Novi for moderator today and all the participants who come to this event. And thank you so much also for uh, Pa Asriano Rifanza as our senior manager for international partnership. Thank you, Mbak Vivi. Thank you, Ms. Vivi and Professor Viviano. Uh, yeah. I just realized you have the similar names. <laughs> yes. Please, please visit us, uh, and hopefully, all the best for your uh, trip to Hong Kong in June. Everything, yeah. hopefully, everything goes well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, all the participants and Professor Viviano and Ibu Novi. Allow me to end this session in three, two, one, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Magasi Bu Novi. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. And stay safe, everyone.